Birth is the beginning by Ann Alvin Fine. Birth is the beginning, death a destination, but life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to t stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to old age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from faith, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage to life everlasting. We gather together today to celebrate the life of John Chalmers Chisholm, which was filled with love, wit, service to others, and a generosity of spirit. On behalf of the Chisholm and the Kirsch clans, thank you for being here with us in sadness, but we are also united in our gratitude. Let us bear witness to John's rich and full life, 102 years of a rich and full life. O oh Lord, you search me and you know me. You know my resting and my rising. You discern my purpose from afar. You mark... You mark when I walk or lie down, all my ways lie open to you. Before ever a word is on my tongue, you know it, Lord, through and through. Oh, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your face? If I climb the heavens, you are there. If I lie in the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and dwell on the sea's farthest end, even there your hand would lead me, your right hand would hold me fast. If I say, let the darkness hide me and the light around me by night, even darkness is not too dark for you, and the night is as clear as the day. Let us pray. Dear God, be with us today as we celebrate and mourn our father, our grandfather, our great-grandfather, our friend. Help us to find comfort in the love that we have for each other and in the memories that live inside of us all. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts find favor in your sight, and let us say, Amen. And, uh, and open up your hymnals to number 625, How Great Thou Art. We'll be singing verses 1 and 4.
now reading from God's holy word. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. A prayer of illumination. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. This morning we come to be reminded of God's promises. We come to experience and trust in God's love. And we come to thank God for the gift of John Chisholm and for his many, many years with us. We come to be assured of God's promises written in Scripture, promises like the one that is found in Romans 8, where Paul writes, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know both the Hebrew and the New Testament scriptures continually speak about God's love for us. We who are God's children God's love revealed to us in the covenant with Abraham. God's love revealed to us in the Exodus. God's love revealed to us through the prophets, and God's love revealed to us through Jesus. Because if you look at Scripture, really what you find is that Scripture is a love story, a history of God's love for humanity. And that love is so strong that nothing on this earth, nothing in the life to come, can ever separate us from God's love, not even death itself. So in a time like this, when we face the mystery of death, we're reminded that not even death itself can separate us from God's love. Scripture says death has lost its sting. It's not the final answer. It's not an end. It's just another kind of beginning. God's love, God's presence is with us in this life and in the life 
to come. And that promise is for us as well. So whatever we are going through or have gone through or will go through in the future, God's love is with us each and every moment of every day. We heard from Psalm 23 that Gary read earlier that God's love is similar to a shepherd's love. A shepherd guards and protects his sheep, watching over them day and night. A shepherd feeds and looks after his sheep, leading them to green pastures and still waters. A, a shepherd will always be with his sheep, even through the valley of the shadow of death. A shepherd treats his sheep like family, cares for them as his own. A shepherd will even lay down his life for his sheep. That's how much God loves us. And that's what God's love for us looks like. Psalm 23 ends with these words, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And that's where John is now, in the house of the Lord, God's house. That's another promise that we find in Scripture that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We also find it in Romans, which says we do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. So whether we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We belong to God always, both in this life and the next, dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. So you will hear much more about John and his life. But in the last couple of weeks of his life, he had went through some rough times, went through those valley times. After he fell, he was rushed to the hospital where the x-rays indicated he had a broken hip. He had surgery, only to have a heart attack a few days later. He was a candidate for hospice care, and a week ago today, hard to believe, a week ago today, he was moved back into his residence at Bay Lake. And that Monday evening, God opened his arms and said, come on in, Major John Chisholm. We have a room waiting for you. Come on into a place where there is no more pain and there are no problems, where all there is is peace. Come on in with your loving and humorous and generous spirit. And John, welcome home. And John probably had an entire welcoming committee waiting for him. His wife of over 70 years, Francis, his mom, Mary, his dad, Andrew, his brother, James, sister, Bessie, and his son, John C. Chisholm, Jr., and countless church and army and golfing and neighborhood friends who have gone on before. I have no doubt that at this moment, John is delighting and rejoicing in the presence of God, the one he worshiped and loved here on earth. And so today we say thanks. Thanks be to God for the life of Major John C. Chisholm. Hallelujah. Amen. A letter for my children, Rachel and Jonathan. According to scientists, the first person to live to 150 years old has already been born. Until last Monday, we perhaps could have been convinced that that person was John Chalmers Chisholm. His death, like his life, considered the needs of others. Years ago, my grandmother would warn him, you better not die first. If you do, I'll have to get a cat but I'll still be mad at you. He heeded her warning and he let her go first, bearing the loneliness for four years and 11 months before finally rejoining her. I've been struggling a lot with what to say today. 
After all, this man lived to be 102. There's a lot of stories to tell, and our time here today is brief. My daughter recently became interested in maps. She's probably the only five-year-old in town that is asking for an atlas for Hanukkah. But it gave me an idea. I thought that I'd sketch the geography of his life and use the places that he loved in order to share with you the depths of his loving kindness and the humor that propelled him throughout his life. Grandpa John was born in Hopewell, Virginia in 1916 to recent immigrants, Andrew and Mary. At the age of only one and a half months, John and his family set sail for Scotland so that his father could enlist in the Black Watch Regiment. Andrew had been deployed for only 17 days when his ship was torpedoed off the coast of Italy. At the war's end, Mary returned to Virginia, widowed and with three small children in tow. The family settled in the Oregon Hill neighborhood of Richmond, and John had great freedom taking the streetcar all over the city, exploring the Hollywood Cemetery, and fishing in the James River. From a young age, John was a strong swimmer. He had to be. Legend has it that his older brother taught him how to swim by tossing him into the river. But his strong muscles and quick reflexes paid off one day, not too long after, when he saved a young friend from drowning. Throughout his life, John would exhibit great care for others. I believe this trait developed from the fact that he witnessed loving kindness up close. His mother was a bit better off than their neighbors, thanks to her widow's pension. She used her extra funds to help care for the children who lived next door, buying ice skates for them in the winter and packing lunches for them during the school year. In addition to seeing the quiet generosity of his mother, John was also influenced by the feistiness of his sister, Bessie. One afternoon, John didn't meet her at their usual place in the schoolyard to walk home together. Instead, Bessie found him waiting outside of the principal's office, awaiting a punishment for some childish transgression. Appalled, Bessie marched into the principal's office and declared to Miss Harrison, if you spank my brother, my mother will never make you see foam candy ever again. The threat worked, and John was off the hook. Yes, he was well looked after, and he would one day pay that kindness forward to other people in his life. Their family didn't have money for college, and frankly, he wasn't interested. When I myself got to elementary school, he told me his secret to writing book reports. Read the first page, the last page, and a page or two in the middle, and you're good to go. If you weren't college material in those days, you embarked in the field of work of your father, and this obviously presented a problem for John. But then he heard about a newfangled thing called air conditioning, and he decided he'd attend night school to learn all about it. The first night of class, he stepped into the wrong room. Once he realized that this was, in fact, a bookkeeping class, he decided to stay anyway, for the simple reason that he had caught the eye of an attractive young girl. John and Francis would later tell me that it was love at first sight, and John abandoned all plans of entering the business of air conditioners, and instead, he gained a wife and a lifelong best friend. The early years of their marriage were spent apart due to World War II. In 1940, when he enlisted in the Army, he was selected for officer candidate school. After being commissioned in September 1942, he was assigned to and commanded the 30th Quartermaster Company of the 30th Inter Infantry Division. He entered combat in June 1944, crossing the English Channel immediately following D-Day, and advanced through Belgium, Holland, and into Germany. While he was proud of his service, he spoke very little about those years until much later in life. Some gentle questioning by one family member during a holiday dinner coupled with the release of Saving Private Ryan, finally prompted Grandpa to tell more war stories. It's revealing, but not surprising, what he chose to share. His stories were filled with his trademark kindness and humor. He would tell of a French farmer who was so overwhelmed with gratitude for the American liberators that she ran to her kitchen and returned with several fresh eggs. Having eaten a lot of spam in the past few months, this was a very welcome sight for the soldiers. 
She issued careful instructions in French, but my grandfather, not understanding other, anything other than merci, just nodded and smiled. He got back to their truck and carefully wrapped each egg in parachute silk, tucking them all securely in a helmet. For three days, they treated those eggs like babies, like the fragile treasure that they were. When they at last stopped long enough to set up camp, you can imagine their surprise when they discovered that these fragile eggs had already been hard boiled. He paid this kindness forward in a multitude of ways while still in Europe. At the end of the war, he was stationed in Hof, Bavaria, where there were strict curfews in place for the German re residents. One night on patrol, he spotted a young child at the other end of the street. It was like a showdown in a Western movie, he would tell me many years later. There I am in my helmet and uniform and boots, and there is this kid in a lederhosen. I put my hands on my hips and I started to explain that he needed to go home, but of course he didn't understand me. He just mimicked me and he put his hands on his hips. They stood there a while and finally, Grandpa made the decision to break the rules. He rounded up some food and gifted it to the child. Now, my grandpa was very much a rule follower, but this wasn't the first time in war that he broke or bent some rules. Each time that he challenged protocol, it was done from a place of kindness and generosity. When he returned home after the war, Francis and John raised a family. Grandpa worked as a purchasing agent by day, and by night and during the weekends, he volunteered as a Sunday school teacher and as a scout leader. He also found himself with an unexpected job. The family's phone number on Claremont Avenue was only one digit off of the local movie theater. Around dinner time, they would receive calls from moviegoers hoping to find out the evening showtimes. Now this, I think many people would agree, would get old after a while, but Grandpa took it in stride. He cut the movie times out of the newspaper and taped them by the phone. Instead of correcting the callers, he simply gave them the information they needed and wished them a good night. Eventually, a new job opportunity brought them to Virginia Beach. They settled in King's Grant in 1967, and they hosted nearly every holiday celebration for 40 years, and they hosted me for countless sleepovers for about 20 of those years. In front of the fireplace, Grandpa taught me how to play checkers. He didn't believe in letting me win. Out in the yard, he taught me how to putt. And he didn't show a bit of annoyance when the lesson resulted not in me gaining any skills, because I didn't, but in a yard that was pockmarked with chunks of uprooted grass. After that, we stuck with checkers when together. From their house, everything that he loved was in easy reach. He volunteered at this church in various ways, but he was most proud of being part of the collection counting team on Sundays. His attention to detail made this an ideal job for him. Also within easy reach were golf courses. Along with several friends, he organized the Bow Creek Seniors Association, and they traveled around playing who knows how many rounds of golf. Some of his proudest achievements included a hole-in-one in 1990 and shooting his age not once, but twice in 2001. He loved the members of their foursome, trading jokes between shots and enjoying meals at Denny's after a day on the course. Golf connected him with his heritage and it was a good exercise, but most importantly, it led to beautiful friendships. When one member of the group, Al Twine, was diagnosed with cancer, the other members took turns driving him to chemo appointments. When someone once expressed admiration at this setup, Grandpa was surprised that anyone might think this extraordinary. To him, taking care of the people in his life was a given. The most arduous time for him was when he was a caretaker for my grandmother, particularly as her Alzheimer's progressed. Whereas she had once done all of the shopping and cooking, he now took on those responsibilities. And he resisted most offers of help. In fact, I think he came to enjoy these new tasks drafting shopping lists in his very meticulous handwriting, scouting out deals in the newspaper, setting the table, washing up, sweeping up, and readying the dishes for the next day's breakfast. But even with his order and devotion, even with my mom making multiple trips to their house each week to lend a hand, the work grew too great, and he reluctantly agreed that they should move to an assisted living facility. 
When he first landed at Bay Lake Retirement Community, he felt a bit lost, but it didn't take him long to find his footing. He learned to play bingo. He attended musical performances and rated them. He built beautiful friendships, both with the other residents, or inmates, as he lovingly called himself and the others, and the staff members. He reported every single burnt out light bulb to the front desk. He successfully campaigned for an automatic door opener in the foyer and a plate warmer in the kitchen. He strategized new ways of organizing the bingo chips by fashioning a prototype of a chip holder out of a toilet paper tube. He presented to-do lists to the staff, and we are very thankful that they accepted these to-do lists so very graciously. Some of them even referred to them as John's love notes. If he ever heard the reply from any of these staff members, thanks, Mr. Chisholm, I'll get around to it, he would present them with an actual round to it. If anything, you could say that he came out of retirement once he arrived at Bay Lake Retirement. One of the things that frustrated him most about being at Bay Lake was that he found it harder to take care of us. But Grandpa, being Grandpa, got creative. He saved crab cakes and enjoyed sharing them with my mom. He also, and this is a secret, began hoarding oranges and bananas for his great-grandchildren. Rachel and Jonathan loved seeing the bags of fruit, which signaled the promise of fresh-squeezed orange juice and what we like to call Bay Lake banana bread. Very little could pull him away from his comfort zone there. He mostly just took short trips to the commissary and to the doctor's office, but his wit went with him everywhere. My mom told me that just as recent as, um, I think it was a month or two ago, at the doctor's office, one of the nurses said to, to him, she said, Mr. Chisholm, what brought you in today? And he looks at her, doesn't miss a beat, and says, my daughter's car. But he grew increasingly reluctant to be away from Bay Lake. The last time he left Virginia Beach was in 2016 for Jonathan's baby naming ceremony in Williamsburg. Rachel delighted in giving him a tour of our house, and he beamed as we explained to our family and friends that Jonathan was his namesake. But he was tired, and he eagerly returned home at the end of the day. Throughout his 102 years, throughout all of these places, Richmond, Europe, King's Grant, Bay Lake, Grandpa John carried with him his humor and his loving kindness. He may no longer be alive, but he is certainly among the living in our hearts. Rachel and Jonathan, I want you two to listen, because these are some of the things of Grandpa that I want you to carry with you. Wherever you go in life, make it your home. Invest in your community. Seek out new places, but also revisit the familiar. May you practice patience and unconditional love. May you find a soulmate and build a beautiful life together. Invest in clothing with pockets. These will serve you well. Fill those pockets with tissues and a notebook and peppermints. Remember that there is no good substitute for a number two pencil and a legal pad, no matter how far our technology advances. Keep a stash of Butterfingers in at least one drawer in your apartment. Replace car batteries before they fail you. Even if you can't cook, and Grandpa certainly couldn't cook, feed the people around you. Remember that a well-timed joke can ease a mood and laughter can cement friendships. And like John, may the last words on your lips be ones of love. And now we'll have our military honors.
in the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. And now I invite you to stand for our closing hymn, which is number 43 on Eagle's Wings. Our soloist, Janet Phelps, will sing the verses, and you are invited to join in on the refrains.
As you are seated, I want to invite you to join me as we share in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. It's a prayer that is printed in your bulletin. And in the Presbyterian Church, we use the phrase and the wording of debts and debtors, but I want you to feel free to to, um, join in the Lord's Prayer in whatever words are most comfortable for you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer for our benediction. Fully compassionate God on high, to our loved one John, who has entered eternity, grant clear and certain rest with you in the lofty heights of the sacred and pure whose brightness shines like the very glow of heaven. And source of mercy forever enfold our beloved John, son of Mary and Andrew. In the embrace of your wings, secure his soul in eternity. God, he is yours. May John rest in peace. And let the people say, amen. You're now invited to join the family in the fellowship hall after the service for a reception. I apologize that the hallway is not completely clear for this weekend. We are setting up for an event that we call Bethlehem Walk, where about 2,000 people come through this building in this coming weekend and as we tell the story of Christmas. And I understand one of the last times John was in this building was about three years ago for Bethlehem Walk. So that is pretty fitting. So please watch your step as you go through the hallway. The Fellowship Hall is on the left. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and know that God goes with you. Um.